crisis in Europe. Uh, we're seeing um, a severe debt crisis in Europe, which we've seen before in other countries, in other continents. We've seen it in Latin America, we've seen it in Asia, we've seen it in Africa, and now it's in Europe. So in this session, we want to get some analysis on what is the situation in Greece, in Portugal, and also uh, in general in Europe. So for this session, I have the, the pleasure to introduce first Sara Vita Rocha, which is from uh, Attack Portugal. Uh, she has been active in Attack Portugal for several years, and she also works for Bloca Esquerda, which is the left party in Portugal. Then we have Yanis Triantafilidis. He is uh, also he's from Attack Greece, so he's been active in Attack Greece for some time, and then he's also the general secretary of um, the Union of Archaeologists on Temporary Contracts. Yeah, which is a specific <laughs> union. So he's an archaeologist and a trade unionist. And then, uh, last but not least, we have Christian Antun Smetzerg. He works, uh, he, he, he's a writer, and he just gave out a book called Debt, How the West Fooled Itself. So he will give us more analysis and details uh, from, from his book later. Um, the debt crisis has also, it's, it's been tried to be solved by uh, harsh austerity measures, and we've seen protests all over Europe. Actually, the protests going on right now in Greece are the most severe protests since uh, the end of the, of the dictatorship in the 70s. It's, uh, it's huge. And actually yesterday, was it yesterday, Yannis? Or the day before yesterday? The day before yesterday, a trade unionist died in the protests. He died from heart, from, uh, heart failure because of all the uh, chemicals that were used by the police, the tear gas and the other chemicals. So he got strangled and died of, uh, of heart disease. Uh, sorry, heart... Uh, uh, failure, um, and this is very sad, and it has uh, a lot of like a lot of us all over Europe now are shocked because of this. And, and he was also a part of the peaceful protest, and he was part of a union that was always trying to calm down the protests and trying to make the trying to uh, stop um, stop the black bloc from actually uh, throwing. Uh, uh, Molotov cocktails and throwing stones. So he was the one of the guys who tried to calm down the protests and he actually died. So that's very, very sad. So this has severe consequences, these, uh, these uh, the austerity measures and the protests that we have. People are angry and we want to find ways, alternative ways out of the, cri out of the crisis. So then uh, the first speaker today is uh, Sara and she will uh, uh, tell us more on the crisis in, in Portugal and, and their alternatives. to try and show you that not everything that's said about Portugal is true and that um, we are going through a really, really rough time and we don't think, well, we don't deserve it. You know, the workers definitely don't deserve it. And especially, it's not going anywhere. So, well, this is not from the presentation. It's actually just um, one of the images of the protests in Portugal, which are also <coughs> growing. Um, we have this kind of joke in Portugal which says that, you know, the only difference really between Greece and Portugal is a year, because we're one year behind, but we're doing exactly the same thing. So this means we're all Greek. And this doesn't apply just to Portugal. Actually, it does apply to many other countries, because the thing is, it can actually happen to you. It, well, Norway probably is kind of safe, <laughs> because you have oil. But uh, there are many, um, many reasons why many countries can't really feel safe. Uh, because uh, what happened to us was so unexpected. Well, it wasn't unexpected after the financial crisis, but it was kind of unlooked for. So uh, it, it will definitely happen in other places, and we know that you know, Spain is under attack as well, Italy is under attack, even France is now getting their ratings uh, down, so we don't really know what's going to happen. So, well, this is um, 
Well, I, I just want to give you an overall idea of, well, um, you talked about the financial crisis yesterday, so you know most of this. You know that it really is still about financial crisis. We, we were doing fairly well. It's not like our economy is perfect, it's far from that. And our governments are really far from perfect. But what really triggered it was uh, the financial crisis. And in 2009, when things started getting a bit rocky, what we did was just plunge money into the financial system, as um, everybody else in the world did. But, you know, it, it costs uh, money to the government, and then it's no surprise that a few years later, you, you are more in debt than you were before that. That's fairly logical. So what you had was, uh, when the crisis started, you had the European Central Bank um, lowering its rates towards banks. And uh, it wasn't financing the uh, sovereign uh, economies, the, the government. So basically what you had was you were giving money to the banks to buy that to, uh, from, from the government. And then you had the same banks um, speculating against that debt. So really, they got really... They had higher and higher interest rates, and they were financed by really lowering interest rates, so they were really making money. Um, and this is the Portuguese 10-year uh, um, government bond yield, and you can see how it's been rising and rising. And basically, in the beginning of 2010, things weren't that bad. Uh, we had a point where a, a minister, the financial minister, said, oh, you know, if we get to 7%, we're really in trouble. And then we got to 7%, and then we got to 8 and then we got higher and higher, and well, and chances are that things aren't getting better. So what we, you did have, you know, uh, is really a neoliberal strategy. It's as plain and simple as that. You, you have a fierce attack from the capitalist system towards um, workers. So what you're saying is basically that, you know, you, the workers, have to pay for the crisis that we've made. Um, and this is really, really immoral, I think, from um, the perspective that what you're saying to banks is, you can do whatever you like, you can take as many risks as you like, because we'll, we'll have you back, we'll finance it, because you're too big to fail. At the same time, you're telling governments, no, no, you can't fail, you have to have perfect um, policies. If you have a crisis, well, you know, you shouldn't really, you should take the money from the workers and from the social services straight into the banks, but you can't get in debt for it. Because if you do, then we'll say to you, you know, you're not uh, credible enough. You, you'll lose your, all your credibility in the market, whilst the banks didn't. The banks got really in debt. They, they caused the whole thing, and they're still working, and they're still looking for new ways to um, make more money. So. I think this kind of shows pretty much how it works. Everything around is burning. And, well, but the bank is, I think it will be a bit cold, but they'll survive. Um, so here are some of the myths, um, especially towards the southern countries. So what to tell you is, you know, you really need a very harsh, very strong adjustment because well, first of all, you've been living above your possibilities, you know. You're, you don't have that much money, you don't work that well, you're kind of lazy. Um, let's face it, <laughs> it's what they say. You have so many holidays and, you know, days off and bank holidays. So you don't work that much, you don't make that much money, and you've been living like kings. So, you know, you should really now start paying for it. Um, so let's have a look at some of these meets and see how they actually look at figures. You know, obviously, you can get figures and do pretty much whatever you want with them, but these are some of, of them and our perspective on it. So you have here um, government debt, and you see Portugal, if you see Portugal is here, and here's Germany. So the government crossed that, and this is until 2009, so it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that scary, and even Italy and Greece here, they were lowering their debts. They were getting better. Um, and so we weren't that far from Germany. Um, you have Ireland here, which also had to go to the IMF. And they were really doing a really, really good job. They were really doing a really good job 
and you get in their debt lower. And then you have that thing there where the banks just go wild. They had 500% of their GDP in the financial system. And so when things got wrong, they got into real big trouble. But the point is, they were doing fine, and Italy and Greece and Portugal were doing better. And then, here, still, we're still talking about 2009, because it's important to see, well, how, well, in 2009, the effect of the crisis wasn't full blown yet. So you can still have an idea of where things were. And so you have, the, the government deficit here in Portugal was already growing a lot. But still, you had other countries going a lot worse. And still, you know, our debt wasn't that big. So we could afford to have a bit of a, st a stress in our deficit to make sure that the financial, um, the financial system didn't collapse. Um, and so we did it. Uh, let me just tell you that, I, well, we can go into all these details uh, afterwards, but we did have a bank that was collapsing. It was a tiny little bank. But um, it was collapsing and the government nationalized it. And basically what they did was they kept all the debts, all the toxic actives, and then they just sell, sold it for a really, really nice price. But that's another conversation. So here we have our budget. We were being good students. We were doing fairly well. Well, it's not like, um, again, our policies weren't perfect, but we were sticking to our commitments. We stopped sticking to our commitments when France and Germany and the States were, as we were, just, dig, uh, just drowning the banks in money to make sure they didn't fall. So that's what we did as well. And obviously, we got an impact on our tax return as well from the fact that the crisis was already hitting some of the companies. So yes, we did have a couple of years of bad deficits. That's true. And now, about living above our possibilities, Really, our government is supposed to be a huge monster, and uh, it's fact, they say. Well, first of all, there are lots and lots of countries who have fatter governments than we do. Uh, some of the, of the, oh, sorry. Some of the Scandinavian um, uh, countries are here as well. And, well, for me, that's a good thing. That means your government is actually providing for services for you and making your life better. So I don't see any problem with it. But the point is, Portugal is right in the middle. Yes, you have Japan and the USA. A bit lower, not that lower. But, um, but yes, we're not that far off. Our government is not outrageous. Now, about competitiveness. You have here our... Uh, nominal unit labor costs. This is a really interesting debate. I won't be able to go into very much detail about it, but I do want to tell you this. Well, you know, everybody's wages go up. Um, well, not in Germany. Germany just pays quite, um, quite low because that's been their policy. You know, Germany has been growing on the expense of most of their workers. Um, so the people who are getting rich in Germany are not exactly the workers, are the businessmen. But yes, in Greece and Portugal and Ireland and Spain, um, wages were a bit up. And because these are the labor costs, once you, once you get into, these are um, their, their averages, and they're divided by the GDP. So what you have is, you get the nominal uh, wages and you divide them by the G G GDP in uh, real terms, which means deflated by inflation. So you're comparing something, which are the labor costs, which have inflation in them because you compensate for inflation in the wages, with something that is being stripped of the inflation. So yes, they grow a lot. They do. Um, but the thing is, these countries have a, a higher in, uh, inflation rates than Germany, for instance. So basically, if you look, if you take that um, effect away, if you just look at real compensation of labor, um, what you get is, again, Portugal and Germany are not that different because we just have higher inflation. You do have, um, Greece has been uh, getting um, a little more remuneration from their work in real terms, um, but Italy and Spain, again, not that much. So basically what we're saying is, it's, it's true that when you're comparing different countries, 
if you're comparing the cost between the different countries um, for business, it's true that the, what interests you is how much it costs. You, you don't care about the inflation in the last years. That comparison is true in the business world. What you can't say is you're getting overpaid. Because in real terms, in the countries, that's not what's happening. We're getting a little bit more, overpay, uh, more pay than we used to in real terms, but not much more than Germany. And then the productivity problem. Are we lazy or not? Well, uh, well, definitely we're not lazy. <laughs> um, but um, the productivity debate is a very, very interesting debate. There's no way we can do it here in the time that we have. But the problem is, you measure productivity by getting all the GDP. And the GDP is measured by the internal consumption, the government consumption, and the external balance, and the investment in the economy. So what they're saying is, you know, if your productivity is lower, that means you're working too much for what you're getting in terms of the GDP. That's it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you work bad, badly. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't work enough. It just means that the product you're getting is not is below what other countries can do with the same amount of hours. And the thing is, that comparison can have so many reasons. So many. You have the structure, you have the way the budget uh, is managed, and you have also the wages themselves. Because a huge part of our GDP, you'll see that in another graph, a huge part of our GDP is actually the internal consumption made by the workers. If you pay less, you have less money in the economy, you have a lesser product. So, you know, if you think that our labor, our productivity is, is bad now, uh, check us out in two years, because we'll be, we'll be earning a lot less and working a lot more, and I guarantee you that we will be, in figures, a lot more lazy than we are now. But that's just not true. So, um, another thing is, one of the reasons, and this is a study done by a Portuguese economist, um, the reason why we got uh, less competitive uh, is because of our, when we got into the euro, um, we had our national currency very overvalued. Um, and so between uh, 91 and 2006, we lost 17% of our um, competitiveness uh, the economies and our uh, external competitors, like the, the countries from the East and China, and well, that will be talked about later. But basically, we lost competitiveness because our wages, being small, were not as small as the wages in China. Um, so that's how it worked. And we weren't able to lower our currency to make us more competitive. So again, it's about economics and the economic system, not uh, how uh, people work. And here is the big one. So are we lazy or not? And that goes for our Greek friends as well. So here you have Portugal. We work on average um, 1,700 hours a year. Um, and that means for, uh, on average 34 per, uh, per week. In Spain, they do 1,600. In Greece, poor things, they do 2,200 hours of work per year on average. And that means that they're working 41 hours per week on average. I, I don't know how it goes in Greece, but in Portugal that's just blankly illegal. So, you know. Um, well, so how's German, you know, the busy ones, the really good ones, the ones that aren't lazy? Well, they work 1,400 hours a year. And, well, here in Norway, 1,400 hours again. Well, we're not saying that you guys are lazy, not at all. You just, you just have a better life. You know, you just have development. That's what development should be about. It should be about people getting their economy going, getting a nice social network of support for people, and working less, if possible, because that will give you time to <coughs> come and debate uh, about economics, to go and be with your families and have some good well-being. So really, it's just not true that we don't work enough. And what Germany said to both Portugal and Greece was, well, you need to work more. So we have eight hours a day now. We'll have eight hours and a half. 
they are taking away bank holidays, they are trying to get away some of the holidays. And so, again, check us out in two years, these figures will be horrifying. Um, another myth is, should we just make ourselves more flexible? Well, it's not working, you know. Our uh, social support for unemployment, for instance, has been lowering. All the, uh, the uh, rules for getting support when you're unemployed are lowering, and our um, employment rate is just going very high. And the thing is, again, you can't just get, get the figures and say, oh, you know, you, if you earn less, uh, and that's what they tell you, if you earn less when you're unemployed, then you'll have a bigger incentive to get a job. Well, really, we, it's not that the incentive that we need. We need to have jobs available, and they are there. So, what we're having is, we have now the fourth, uh, fourth, fourth highest rates of unemployment in OECD countries. 60% um, of the people, that's a calculation, it's not obviously the official rate, because after you've been unemployed after a certain time, you just stop having any support, and sometimes it just didn't work uh, enough months to get support. So basically 60% of these people are without any support. You have a ton of precarious workers, and every time you create a new job, it's more precarious. We have, we were talking yesterday, we have um, uh, workers that are supposed to be independent workers. Oh my god. Okay, so let's go from there. Uh, I'm really, really bad on timing now. So, is austerity the way out? Um, we don't think so, not at all. Things are going worse and worse. Uh, and um, we need to find other alternatives. Main policies in Portugal. What we did was, once we realized we were in trouble, we thought, oh my god, we're really good students and now we're doing so much uh, worse. So what we'll do is, we'll try to keep the IMF out by doing exactly what the IMF would say to us, without the money. Um, so we started raising all the taxes, lowering all the social services. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to go into detail uh, through all of these measures. Um, but basically, the wages are going down, all the taxes are going up, all the services that you didn't use to pay for, you're paying in, you're paying them. And you just totally stop public investment. Social security is going totally, uh, it's disappearing, and what we can tell you, well, again, this is a very ideological shock, you know, they're not just thinking, oh, we don't have any money, we should cut on social spending. What you have is all the ideologies in, in, in Europe and behind the, the German uh, strategy are saying, your government is too nice to people, so you should just uh, cut on all of that, and become more capitalist, that's the thing. So when we got into the Troika rescue, we call it the Troika because it's the European, I don't know if you use that term, it's the European Union, the Central Bank, and, um, and the IMF. Again, we're not just cutting, we're changing things in a way that they've never changed before. We're privatizing waters, we're privatizing electricity, transports, mail services, all of the things that we're public are going to be privatized. By the way, really cheaply, because the market is so bad, so we're just giving it away. Um, public health and education are the sectors that are going to be suffering more from the cuts. And they say that we can do better. Again, you know, we have people inside saying we're really lazy, so we can just make it better without uh, any of the money and with much less of people. We'll just do the same. And we're having a radical labor market change. We can. And then uh, we can just dismiss people in a much faster way. Okay. In 2012, the budget, the proposal for the budget, which is now being uh, discussed, is a nightmare. It's not as bad as the Greek uh, have it now, but it, it's going there. Again, we're one year behind, but we'll get there. But still, it's a massive shock. There'll be hunger in Portugal in a massive scale. Um, well. You can read through all the measures, I won't have time to, to go into that now. This is important. Can we export our way out of the crisis? Why can't we? Because no matter, you have the exports that are in yellow, and then you have the internal consumption in red. 
And again, as we were saying, the internal consumption is made out of wages. So if you totally cut on that huge red part, you know, it's almost impossible that you can export enough to compensate. So it is important to export and to have a place in the international market, but it won't be enough if we don't have an internal market. And what you have is, if you compose all the austerity measures in all the countries in Europe, because it's not just Portugal and even Spain, every country in Europe is cutting back on their wages um, and on their social services. So what you have is, where are you going to export to? You know, we used to export to Spain, now we can't. We used to export to Italy, now we can't. So where are you going to export to China? Well, they're selling us, so you know, it won't work. Well, this is basically just saying what is important here is who pays for the adjustment is massively the household. You'll have some of it in the government and a tiny little bit in the companies, but it's mainly on the household. And well, this this is just how the the the, the rise of the interest rates um, is getting to the GDP in a really harsh way, and it's one of the main things. So the speculative attack we had on our government bonds is making us a lot more indebted than we would have been just with our policies as they were. So they are really telling us, you know, just pay now and you'll leave sometime. We, we used to think it was like in two years, but now we really don't know when any of us will be able to have children, for instance, because we just can't afford it. And if austerity works, well, not really. You have the austerity packs that we had before the IMF. And then you have, when the IMF came in, just to settle the markets down and said, no, now we're here, everything's okay. Well, not really, the markets aren't happy. They won't stop. And well, our forecasts are great. We're going to have really nice views from now on. Um, we'll be more unemployed, we'll have everything more expensive, and we will have a lot less products. So, well, maybe I'll come back in two years and say. Um, and the thing is, we really can't afford not to grow right now. Because if you look here, this is, um, these are uh, indicators, um, especially when you see the GDP per capita. It's wage by the different uh, level of prices in different countries. That's what we call the power parity um, prices. So we're kind of comparing um, in a real term. And you have Norway with $52 per capita. Well, this is $1,000 per capita. And then Portugal has 23. Spain has 30. And Greece has 29. You know, even if we are getting a little bit better pay than we were in the 80s, we're far from rich, and people do struggle a lot, especially, obviously, the people in the lower parts of society. So, very briefly, what alternatives do we have? Well, we have to stop uh, the social spending cuts. We need to get into the banks and tell them you have to separate your uh, investment um, <coughs> operations from your just deposits and credit operations. You have to isolate what is your financial, um, your role as finances of the economy from your role as speculators. Because, you know, if you fall on the, on, the, on the bond market, we don't really care. You know, if you're just losing the stock market, who cares? Just go under. But you can't take the whole economy with you. Um, and so, obviously, you need some public investment. You need some sort of, I don't know, Marshall Plan for Europe because this is definitely not working. And you need to audit all the debts. There are many of these debts that are made with absolutely corrupt contracts on both sides. You know, All of us have uh, uh, contracts with Germany, for instance, which are in court because we, we got to pay a lot more than we should have. So you truly need to audit um, all of those debts. And you have to change Europe. You know, we can't go on with Europe just being based on money uh, and just being based on making business and not making sure that the results of that business go to the people. So, well, there are many measures you can have. Um, the tax on financial transactions is one. Having euro bonds, which actually make all of the countries uh, responsible for the debts and try to which kind of makes them uh, have to help each other. 
and some sort of economic government might be an idea. Um, but you just have to change. And what you really need to do is you have to listen to the streets. You know, it's all there. It's not just the people being silly and say, oh, you know, I can't really eat today. They, they know if you go into one of those protests, and we can tell you a bit more about it later, you, you look at the posters that people have in their hands, and they're just so right. They're economically right. Um, so you need to listen to what's on the streets. You need to listen to what people need. And you need to make sure that whatever development you have goes to the people and not to the markets. And that's it. Thank you.